Welcome to yet another edition of the Rebound series with me, Farai Mwakutuya, your host. It is a pleasure for you to join us and we certainly look forward to an interesting and engaging discussion where today we are focusing on something that is, uh, you know, at the heart and that is affecting many people, particularly here in the capital city, Harare, and that is congestion traffic congestion, but also the challenges that commuters are facing trying to get home and trying to get to work on time. Those are some of the issues that we'll be tackling on this edition of the program. My first guest in the studio at this point in time are none other than Assistant Commissioner Paul Nyati. He is the spokesperson for the Zimbabwe Republic Police. Sir, great to have you on the program. Uh, welcome, Fede. Thank you. Uh, alongside him is uh, Mr. Ngoni Kachairo. He's from the Greater Harare Association of Commuter Omnibus Operators. Sir, great to have you on the program. Thank you for inviting us, Fari. As is well known, I think, you know, these two groups don't often see eye to eye. And so uh, we look forward to a very engaging, but what is more crucial, a very instructive and constructive discussion in terms of the way forward. I will begin with you, Assistant Commissioner. Uh, the situation on Arari Roads at this point in time, if you go uh, 5 p.m., 6 p.m., on the streets trying to get out of the CBD, uh, trying to come into the CBD in the early morning, very difficult, very difficult to move around, to drive around. What do you think is behind that? Uh, a, a number of factors, uh, Fere. Uh, and uh, this is uh, on record, this is uh, factual. You know, the volume of uh, traffic on our roads, not only in Arari, but uh, in other cities, is, uh, is increased over the, the years. And then uh, you also have the infrastructure the, the roads, you know, uh, the roads have not uh, expanded uh, for a long time. And also the issue of portals, where we've had rains, like for the last season, we had, uh, you know, good rains. And the, um, the rains damaged some roads where you now have portals, you now have gullies. And these are also contributing towards uh, the, 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 the chaos which we are seeing on the roads. And then you also have uh, the issue of traffic lights where you find that for a long time the traffic lights particularly in the CBD have not been functional and it is you know causing a lot of challenges in terms of policy because we have had to withdraw officers from other duties to come and man these you know uh, junctions these intersections these non-functional uh, traffic lights and as we do so you also have the attitude of motorists, where you have some motorists who don't care at all, if I may say so. You have some motorists who want to be told that uh, if a robot is not functional, you have to cross in this manner. Yet it should be that uh, a licensed driver should just exhibit an, ex an exemplary conduct on the road. You know, we have a problem. You go to Chiremba with complaints along Chiremba Road, in the morning and in the evening, we have complaints along uh, you know, Araruru or Mavuku Tenov. We also have complaints currently 
yeah, rural tourist road. And uh, you also had complaints along um, the Harare Ulawa in Tenwood area, where you find that during peak hours, motorists are driving against the flow of traffic. Mm -hmm. yeah? Just imagine, a licensed motorist driving against the flow of traffic. In the, uh, personally, I have experienced it along Chiremba Road, mm -hmm. uh, where you find somebody comes full speed, facing you, flashing lights for you to move off the road. I'm telling you, mm -hmm. this is what it happened in Harare. Mm -hmm. To say, move off the road so that I can pass. But mm -hmm. the person is driving against the road rules and regulations, mm -hmm. committing an offense, posing a danger to other motorists who will be driving properly. Mm -hmm. So there are a number of reasons when it comes to congestion, where you also need the motorists to play ball. Mm -hmm. The point you've just raised about people who willingly and flagrantly flout rules, go against the flow of traffic, committing those offenses. Is there any action taken against them? Or, uh, as you say, they just ignore the police officer or what is being directed and they just drive off and keep going? We, we have taken action in Farai. We will continue to take action. We, besides the deployments which we have uh, done on these uh, uh, junctions, intersections or non-functional traffic lights, we are also recording vehicle registration uh, numbers where you find that uh, we will be publishing uh, particulars of certain uh, motorists through these uh, vehicles to say can you report to Harare traffic so that you can answer for what you did on this particular day. We have got some recordings of which very soon we'll be publishing and uh, I, can't, I can't go into detail even during the course of this week, we are also going to do something against the drivers who are driving against the flow of traffic. And uh, guess what, Farai? Mm. We, we used to talk about the driver of, of public service, uh, the conduct of public service uh, drivers. Mm. But these days, it's private vehicles. Private, go along Chiremba, you see private vehicles driving against one way. Go along Akchuras uh, Road, go along you know, Arariblao Road, in Town Road. It's, you know, private drivers who are now causing problems. Mm. And, you know, some of the, these drivers, they get involved in accident, run away. Mm -hmm. They don't stop. Mm -hmm. Yet the road traffic act is very clear. After one has been involved in an accident, they have to stop, report to the police. Where somebody has been injured, they have to render assistance it's, and allow the due processes of the law to be followed. But this has not been the case. And in the process, you also stretch the main power which the Zimbabwe Republic has. Because remember, we also have other duties to attend to. We've got robbery cases to attend to. We've got murder cases to attend to. We've got, you know, stock theft cases to attend to. But because of the conduct of some of the motorists on the roads, we've had to focus on deployment. You go to Seke Road. Mm -hmm. You can't pass at the junction of Deep Road and Seke Road near Coca-Cola without officers controlling traffic. It's, 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 it's chaotic, to be honest. But we have had to station officers there permanently just to control traffic. So while at least the, the cabinet has set uh, some parameters, the cabinet has set a, a ministerial task force to deal with the issue of congestion, yes, you know, for all cities, but particularly in Harare, we also want motorists to play ball. Because, uh, yes, the government might do everything which it can, so that we deal with the issue of congestion. But we also need that to be complemented by the conduct of drivers. Indeed. There's, there's no need for one to be on the hurry every day. Why should you be in a hurry? Plan your time, plan your journeys, so that you don't become a danger to other motorists. Indeed. Let me turn to you uh, very quickly, Mr. Kachairo, and uh, find out from you. Um, we know that for a long time, because of COVID, some of your members uh, and some of the vehicles have not been on the roads, uh, but we still see some of them. Uh, and unfortunately, some of them also falling foul of some of these rules that have been mentioned. Uh, why is that? Who, as an association, these issues of awareness, of, of endangering passengers and things like that, is that something that you are going to act on because it has been happening for a long time now? Uh, thank you, Farai. Um, Happy Essence Commissioner has uh, indicated also that uh, the chaos that we are witnessing in the CBD, uh, most of the 
the combi operators are no longer on the road. Most of the combi drivers are no longer on the road, but we still see the, the chaos uh, on, and traffic congestion on, on our roads. Uh, that also absorbs a bit some of our operators, some of our drivers, and we are continuously working on that. Those who are errant, we are coming together as an association and putting together some code of conduct for our, for our drivers, especially those who are now at Zubco, because those ones you are seeing, seeing in town now, granted they are operating illegally, taking advantage of an opportunity of the shortage of transport, but they are illegal. Uh, they are not members of our association. Our members have got their vehicles parked or they are at Zubco or they are contracted to, to, to companies. So we continuously talk to those who are still operating illegally. But those who are operating illegally are at Zubco and contracted to companies. Indeed. <coughs> uh, Assistant Commissioner, he's just mentioned that there are some that are operating illegally. Why? Why do we still see those combis on the roads? Why aren't they being impounded or stopped? Uh, Afare, since the 1st of January 2021, the Zimbabwe Republic Police has been conducting an operation against pirate taxis, an operation against Mishika Shika. And as of this week, we have uh, impounded over 80,000 vehicles. And this is on record. I'm telling you the truth. Yeah. And among these uh, 8,000 vehicles, yeah. you have combis, you have private vehicles, the Toyota, which, is, which are becoming a menace on the roads, the Toyota uh, Ram, the Toyota Vitz, the Wonder Fit, these are being used to cause chaos on the roads. And some of the vehicles, they're even plying the intercity roads, just imagine. And even doing so at night. And above all, against the government's COVID-19 regulations, where people will be crammed. Yesterday I was in Chinoy. You know, wh wh what I saw in, in, along the area was pathetic, to say the least. You find people crammed. I stopped one on the feet where there were four people at the front, including the driver. I'm telling you what I saw yesterday in between Harare and Chinoy. Mm -hmm. And uh, you find that in most situations, the people will not be wearing uh, masks and the people are not practicing social distance. So what it entails is people are people are exposed <coughs> to COVID nineteen, mm -hmm. uh, which is really a danger. So besides these uh, impounds which we have done, we are also uh, trying to engage the operators. We have had meetings with, with the city of Ferrari, we have had meetings with the uh, Ministry of Local Government, the Ministry of Transport uh, and also the, 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 the combo operators, which are operating under the super franchise, mm -hmm. so that we can find a lasting solution to some of these uh, uh, illegalities which we are seeing on the roads. And I'm happy to say the cabinet has adopted an integrated uh, approach where they want all stakeholders to come on board so that we can deal with the issue of congestion, we can deal with the issue of, you know, a movement for members of the public when they go for work, when they report uh, off duty, so that they are assisted. And I hope this uh, integrated approach will solve some of these problems. But for these approaches to work, we also need the drivers mm. to be responsible on the road. Mm. Where a, you know, a, a traffic light is not functional, let's wait. Let's give way to the one who has got the right to go through. Let's just be patient, you see. Let's not wait for the police to force us to cross road junctions where the traffic lights are not operational. And this is becoming a challenge, I tell you. And in some of these cases, you find that people, they then have what to call hit and run accidents. Mm -hmm. Where school children are run over, the driver does not dis he stop. And when we are looking for some of these drivers, every week, if you check on our social media page, particularly Twitter page, we are publicizing cases where we are looking for drivers who have run over uh, pedestrians. And in most cases, this is in the CBD, along the highway, in built-up areas. Very quickly, what is the success rate of, of those appeals that you put on social media? You know, very successful. We, we, we have arrested the drivers 
who have had uh, these hit and run accidents and they have been on the run and through the cooperation of the public we have managed to uh, track them and I also want to urge uh, combi operators yes we know that they are pleading with the government in terms of their operations but uh, as long as they are not under the Zupuko franchise they will be operating outside the law they should go and plead their case with the government so that we also safeguard the lives of those people who would be bought in their vehicles. And besides taking action against Mishika Shika vehicles or pyrotaxis, we are also taking action against people who are waiting for these vehicles at undesignated points for us. That's a point I, I, I certainly wanted to take you up on. I'll stop you now because we need to take a short break. It is the Rebound Series. Stay tuned. We'll be back with much more when we return. Every Zimbabwean wants their country to return to its former glory, and we believe that we have a role to play in doing that. So we'll be speaking to different Zimbabweans from different facets of life to share their views of what it will take to get Zimbabwe to rebound. The Rebound series comes to you every Friday between 5 and 6 p.m. on the Heart and Soul digital platforms. Join me, Farai Mwakutuya, for those incisive discussions. Welcome back to the Rebound series where today we are focusing on decongestion of uh, Zimbabwe roads and Harare in particular. Mr. Kachairo is from the Greater Harare Association of Commuter Omnibus Operators. The point that was made before we enter the break by the Assistant Commissioner about the fact that uh, commuter op omnibuses that we see on the roads that are not under the Zupco banner are doing so illegally. Why is it that not all combis are under that? Because, as you mentioned, it's been very painful for your members who have had to park their vehicles. That is a loss of revenue. Surely they would want to be plying routes, to be doing the business that they went into. Why are they not under Zupco? Um, I think uh, it's a, a whole lot of things that are contributing to uh, uh, most uh, combi operators not joining Zupco. Uh, first and foremost, uh, when the program started, uh, the payments for the higher fees were commensurate with the, the cost of operating a combi. As we moved on, uh, they were eaten by inflation. Mm -hmm. Then uh, the engagements of increasing the fees were taking long. So people started pulling out. Mm -hmm. As they pulled out, they started operating uh, illegally. So uh, for those who remained at, at Zupco, we still find there are some challenges where there are late payments, uh, vehicles cash at Zupco on a daily basis, and then uh, they get paid after a month or even two months. When your vehicle breaks down, uh, you are not able to raise the cash to repair your vehicle, which also then uh, uh, poses danger even to the passengers because some of our vehicles then becomes unroad worth. Uh, once that uh, once that happens, we could find this, there are situations where one cannot even be able to buy tires or even repair his suspension. Then they just park their vehicles. That will create shortages at Zupco in terms of uh, vehicles. If I can take you back in time, uh, before the advent of uh, Zupco, we had over ten thousand combis operating in Harare alone and over 50,000 combis operating nationwide. But at the moment, you can witness yourself from the crisis, transport crisis that is, a, a, that is occurred in, in the CBD, especially that is occurring in the CBD, especially during peak hours. It's because the numbers of vehicles that are at Zupco are not coping with the numbers of uh, with the number of passengers that needs to be ferried to, uh, to from point A to B, especially du during peak hours, um, the enrollment at Zupco is not increasing because of the challenges of uh, low payments and late payments. So we are engaging the government, the Minister of Transport, the Minister of Local Government, so that that can be uh, improved uh, in terms of uh, the the higher fees. Once the attractive fees are paid to operators, they'll be able to enroll at Zupco. But besides that, 
we are saying we also need competition between Zupco and, and operators. Mm -hmm. So we are saying, just like the situation that was in Blawayo, we need the operators to be an, in associations. Once operators are in, in well-organized associations, which they can self-regulate and uh, self-discipline and self-monitor, we can have a, a, a franchise by the operators themselves operating alongside Zupco, where Zupco can be allocated a corridor uh, the association franchise can also be operating from another corridor or we can have a mixture of that of that model where one puts one or two vehicles at Zupco and then they can have uh, the, uh, the rest of their vehicles in the in the association franchise operating alongside and complementing uh, Zupco that way we can alleviate this, the shortage of transport and also ensure that there is a continuous cash flow amongst operators so that they can uh, be able to replace uh, and maintain uh, their vehicles. They can also be able to acquire the statutory government uh, uh, documents which uh, all the vehicles need to have uh, to operate. That is the route authority, the passenger insurance, the vehicle insurance, which will also protect the passengers. So once Zupco uh, does not play their role of paying on time, it also means they are passing on the risk to the passengers and the drivers themselves. Mr. Gatsairo, your association existed even before we had these uh, COVID issues that we are facing now. Uh, but even then, we still saw commuter om om omnibus operators flouting rules, not going to the ranks that were designated and said that this is where, you know, you should uh, park. Uh, though all those things were still ignored even uh, then in your existence. So how do you think that associations will now play that role of self-regulating um, and be effective? We made a number of recommendations to the Minister of Local Government and also City Council. And we even had a learning visit to, to Blawayo where we saw how the uh, transport model was created in, in Blawai, that is operating, that was operating then in Blawai was created. We recommended that there needs to be a, a law or a bylaw where, first of all, we recognize associations. We, we pass an SI or a bylaw which uh, encourages operators uh, to join an association of their choice and then permits would be issued to those associations, not to individual operators. What brought the order in Arara is individualism. Unlike in Blawayo, where there were only three associations operating. And those three associations, most of the operators were members of any one of those three associations. Those three associations were then allocated uh, routes and corridors that way they were operating. Blawai was divided into three routes where we have Bukta operating on the eastern side, uh, Chovambayo on the western side, and uh, BCTT uh, on the central side. So they were competing amongst themselves but not uh, on the same route. O operators from the same association would uh, organize their vehicles in a manner that would uh, reflect better organized and better uh, service than operators at, uh, at the other uh, section of the of the corridor. So that's the uh, creation of competition between associations uh, amongst their corridors uh, ensured that the, there was good service to the passengers and also uh, income flow for the operators from that particular corridor. Do you think that this would help in Harare, yeah. Assistant Commissioner? As long, uh, Farai, people uh, are speaking with one voice and the people are serious about providing quality service to the public. You know, what has happened in, in Blawayo should just be replicated in Harare, particularly in Harare. Why I'm mm. saying so? It becomes easy in terms of policy. We know whom to deal with. When there are issues, we can easily approach the association and say, can you deal with the RN members? But in Harare, it has been a challenge where you have these you know, associations sprouting, and the some they are saying we don't recognize the associations. So they are operating willy nilly, and in the process, they are the ones who go on to pick passengers at undesignated points. Look at, at the NASA along 2nd Street, mm -hmm. where you find that uh, you know, going the, the, the Bindura route. Yes. It's, 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 it's a danger yes. there. Mm -hmm. You go again uh, the, the, the road port, people who pick passengers you know, outside the ranks. These are people who, in most cases, they are not licensed to be operating as transporters. 
So the issue of associations should be taken serious by the committer operators. And also, it also assists in terms of regulating the conduct of their drivers. Mm -hmm. And it makes the job of the police easier. So let me ask you this so I can get a better understanding of that. I was actually going to talk about that issue of, I don't know, if, as you say, illegal ranks. You mentioned the NASA corner further up the road on 2nd Street. You still see it happening. But I also see sometimes traffic police there. So how does, it, how does that uh, point continue to be a rank when we sometimes see police there? Or you know that it's there and, and still people still operate and pick up people from there? As I alluded to in my earlier uh, statement, if I write, the people who are waiting for the combis, if I may say so, mm -hmm. or for the taxis at these undesignated points, they are also committing an offence. Mm -hmm. And we have arrested some of these would-be passengers, and the people have complained. That's why we are saying we need an inclusive approach mm -hmm. where you don't have motorists trying to pick passengers at places which they are not supposed to be doing so. Mm -hmm. The moment we stop that, then there is law and order in the city. Commuter rings which have been designated should just be utilized. I'm telling you, and I want to appeal with people who are operating legally to say, please, for the safety of your passengers, for the maintenance of law and order in the country, let's pick passengers from the designated commuter rings. And they, you know what? Once all combis rank in designated uh, commuter pickup points, the people who go there. That I can assure you. Do those ranks work? Is, is it, are people not going, are, 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 are operators not going there because they are not strategic in terms of their location? Why is it that there's no desire to go there? Uh, currently, Farai, I think uh, you are aware that uh, those uh, combis that are operating along the roads which have been indicated by a sense commissioner uh, Nyati, and as I've also alluded to, they are I illegal. Mm -hmm. So even if they go into the rank, they remain illegal mm -hmm. if they are not at, uh, at Zubko. That's why we are appealing to Minister of Local Government and Minister of Transport to recognize associations and then allow those combis that are in associations to start operating. Once they start operating and they've been they've been recognized by, by the two ministries and they start operating, then we can address the issues of uh, those who are operating outside outside ranks. But even before the advent of uh, the COVID rule, you would find that uh, all the four or five uh, 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 central business districts uh, ranks uh, had, uh, uh, were being used by, by our combis. They were full of combis. Of course, there were others who were operating uh, on the streets in Mishikashika, and those needed to be dealt with. But those who were operating legally, I think they need to be considered and brought back uh, onto the road through the associations and through the recognition of those uh, uh, operators through the, uh, the, the Minister of Transport and Minister of uh, Local Government. That's for urban and uh, rural operators. How are those discussions going? Uh, they are ongoing, but uh, because of uh, COVID, that's the reason that is being given for for limiting the number of, uh, I mean, for not allowing combis to, to come back. But I think uh, uh, we are past that stage. We need to, to start looking at uh, authorizing uh, those combis uh, to get back on the road illegally. Otherwise, they continue to, to, to operate illegally. And then it defeats the whole purpose of... Uh, of uh, mitigating the spread of COVID. Because if you look at it right now, the number of wishes, Noah's, uh, trucks and lorries that are carrying passengers without regard to any of those uh, COVID mitigation measures, it's, it's quite uh, numerous. So the reason uh, is no longer valid. Mm -hmm. So we are engaging the Minister of Transport and the Minister of uh, Local Government on that basis because the uh, uh, honestly, Zupko is not coping with the with the urban transport. Honestly, the highway, uh, as alluded by by my colleague here, uh, has been in, has now been infested with illegal transport operators. But they are also taking advantage of the shortage of transport, which means there's a gap that needs to be filled. Mm -hmm. But that gap needs to be filled by combis that are parked right now. Yet they are the ones which we which are suitable for carrying passengers. How easy will it be? If you got that authority to say, okay, come back on the roads for those combis to come back on to come back and start operating, because I would imagine 
these cars have been parked for over a year. They need to be made roadworthy. You need to find drivers again. All that documentation. How will that? What will be the roadmap back? Uh, it, it will not be easy, Farai, but it's a it's something that needs to be to be done. Uh, to for one to be able to bring back a vehicle on the road with all the papers, uh, road width, with the VID uh, inspection certificates, uh, new tires and everything. You need about one thousand three hundred uh, US dollars. Uh, so once the arrangements for those vehicles to come back on the road uh, are, are made, we also need to look at the issue of uh, uh, staggering, uh, especially the acquiring of papers. Of course, you can't stagger the issue of uh, having the vehicle being roadworth. But the, the issue of papers, we can always talk and say, uh, by the such such a time, you need to have all the, your statutory papers in place. And uh, uh, before, but before the vehicle comes onto the road, you need to make sure that you have got a, 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 a correctly a, and a up to scratch a suspension of your vehicle and also the tires. Those cannot be an exception, but uh, the statutory papers, I think we need to go into discussion with the government about that because uh, uh, the amount of money that is needed is quite a huge amount. Assistant Commissioner, before we, we wrap up this segment of the discussion, uh, I think uh, you, know, you said something that was very telling earlier, where you are saying it is the motorists, private vehicle owners who are flouting, knowingly flouting these rules, driving opposite side of the road um, at times. Any final or parting word you have in terms of, you know, the role they are playing in creating the chaos, in perpetuating it? Uh, Farai, you know, road safety is a collective responsibility. It's not the preserve of the police alone. We only come in on the enforcement side, but we also need motorists to be exemplary. You know, being exemplary entails, you know, being patient, when there is uh, somebody uh, on your front, it entails being patient when you come across traffic lights which are not operational. It entails being patient when one you know, is approaching a junction. And also, let's avoid driving against one way. Let's avoid creating imaginary third, fourth lanes, especially during peak hours. And also, they must recognize that uh, you know, peaking people at undesignated points is also a danger. And above all, some of the motorists, they are not registered. They have vehicles which have no number plates. And they, you know what? People have been robbed. Only last Friday, I had a journalist, just imagine, a journalist who lost her cell phone when she boarded a BMW in the city centre, which had three occupants. This young lady was then robbed of her cell phone. Eh? Just imagine. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, you know, because of the concern by other innocent motorists, they've had to record motorists driving against one way and pass on the information to the police and for I, police to take action. Indeed, and I think that is something that should be you know, recommended and, 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 and called upon and, and encouraged amongst motorists that, you know what, if you see someone flouting the rules, hit and runs, those sort of things, take down that information, record it if you can, and share it with the police. Because as you quite rightly say, it is our responsibility. If I flout the rules here, yeah, if I create a third lane, then I'm delaying everyone else in the process. So clearly, uh, you know, it is incumbent upon all of us as motorists and as citizens uh, who are in this city of Harare and indeed the country of Zimbabwe. Uh, this brings to an end this part of the program. Next segment, we'll be looking at uh, the technical side, the infrastructure side of decongesting Harare. I'll be speaking to an engineer from the Ministry of Transport and Infrastructure Development to tell us, uh, do we need wider roads? Do we need flyovers? Do we need bypasses? What is the way forward for that? And a whole lot more. Stay tuned to the Rebound series. We'll be back shortly. Every Zimbabwean wants their country to return to its former glory and we believe that we have a role to play in doing that. So we'll be speaking to different Zimbabweans from different facets of life to share their views of what it will take to get Zimbabwe to rebound. The Rebound series comes to you every Friday between 5 and 6 p.m. on the Heart and Soul digital platforms. Join me, Farai Mwakutuya, for those incisive discussions.
Welcome back. The Rebound series continues now. Uh, before we enter the break, I was speaking to uh, representatives from community, or community omnibus operators as well as those who are responsible for policing the roads, that is the Zimbabwe Republic Police. Uh, and one of the key things that came up there when I did ask what they thought were the uh, you know, reasons behind the challenges we see with congestion, particularly in Harare, was the state of the roads. Uh, the fact that they had been expanded, that the number of vehicles has grown, that there are potholes and some of those roads are perhaps not in the best of states. Now, to talk about that and a whole lot more, I'm now joined by Engineer Maron Pasipamire from the uh, Ministry of uh, Transport and Infrastructure Development. Engineer, great to have you on the program. Thank you so much, Farai. Um, I think uh, this is a good uh, program that you're having, and we are certainly grateful to be invited to such uh, forums uh, so that we can discuss issues to do with uh, national development. Thank indeed, you. indeed. Now, uh, as I quite well, as I mentioned, the, the police uh, spokesperson did say the state of the roads uh, perhaps needs to be addressed from a technical point of view, because you are, this is your area. Uh, what is, is that the reason? Is that one of the major driving causes behind the traffic chaos that we see in Harare? You see, Farai, uh, congestion is, is basically uh, as a result of a concoction of, of other uh, many factors that come into play. Some of them, they won't even, um, we won't even see them uh, on the roads per se, but there are other factors that are hidden behind uh, congestion. But basically, if you look at congestion, unfortun unfortunately, on my part, it's, it, it then manifests on the road because mm -hmm. it is basically uh, your supply, uh, uh, your, your demand exceeding the supply in terms of uh, road infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So basically, infrastructure is where uh, that um, uh, road congestion then manifests. So indeed, um, uh, road infrastructure has got a big part to play in terms of, of congestion. Um, it's uh, the deficit that we have on infrastructure and also even the solutions that we that can then be proffered will also come in in part of um, addressing the infrastructure. Mm. Uh, you, you talk about the deficit. Let's, let's talk a bit about that and, and say, look, um, I would have imagined that a scenario like this would have been planned for, that we know there is expansion of the capital city, more and more people are coming into the city. Uh, would there not have been a plan to, to say, look, we anticipate there will be this number of vehicles and this number of commuters, uh, or have we exceeded that? We have certainly exceeded that. You see, Farai, like I've said, there are many other factors that then come into play. Uh, one such factor, which probably is going to answer what you're asking right now, is that of town planning. Mm -hmm. If you look at Harare as an example, uh, if probably uh, those who planned in those years that they were planning, they had envisaged um, this um, growth in vehicular traffic popu population, maybe we, we could have had uh, better planning in terms of our sp the space that was then left for uh, road expansion. If you look at Blawayo, for example, it's way different from Harare, mm -hmm. where you have so much space even uh, for traffic currently and even for future traffic, you do have that. So there are many other factors that then come into play, but certainly from a town planning point of view, I think um, that's where also our challenges then come from mm -hmm. to say what space was left for future expansion. Currently, if you look at Harare, there is basically uh, little that we can do in terms of the space that is available, say for probably to introduce uh, viaducts. Mm -hmm. yeah. Viaducts being for some of us who, who are not <laughs> sure. Uh, <laughs> viaducts being wha what you then term overpasses, uh, probably in in lighter language. But mm -hmm. uh, those those are roads that then tend to fly over other roads uh, within the same vicinity. So I think that's what the, that those are the options that we are left with. But then with those options, you cannot introduce them in the short to medium term. Those are long-term solutions because of the initial capital outlay that is, that, that, that is then involved. So it's, it's a bit difficult uh, for us to adopt some of the solutions that we, can, we, we would want to proffer because of um, our financial position. But there are solutions to this. But mainly, I think the issues of space uh, have also... Uh, compounded the situation in Harare. Uh, we'll come back to the, to the long-term solutions. Sure. One of the things that we've heard, certainly, you know, city authorities trying to push 
over the last few days, and I think ultimatums have been issued to people who are operating businesses close to uh, streets in Harare, close to the roads, asking them to move out. Uh, would that be in a, in a bid to try and create space, perhaps, to expand and, and widen the roads? But I, one aspect also that uh, one, one major cause of um, congestion is driver and pedestrian behavior. So if you look at driver and pedestrian behavior, if we are looking at the veggies of the road, as you say, mm -hmm. we are trying to clear the veggies of the road. Why are we doing that? We are trying to clear the space for pedestrians so that they do not mix with, with uh, vehicular traffic. Mm -hmm. So in, in that way, it is not going to solve the problem per se, but it is going to be part to the solution. So I think um, that will also come in to, 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 to render its own um, fair share of um, part of the solution. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's how I see it in terms of uh, what, what the city council is then doing in terms of removing uh, people and businesses from the veggies of the road. Growing up, I remember, well, certainly at, at one point, being going to school on a bike and things like that, there were cycle tracks. Sure. There were places that were designated for that. We don't see those anymore. Sure. They, it's a pity. It's a pity that you're mentioning it, Farai. And uh, <laughs> you see, myself, from where I stand, we are the people who should actually be um, saying in every um, road project that we, that we then do, we should actually be introducing those uh, cycle tracks, those uh, pedestrian walkways. And um, I'm, I'm glad to say that uh, with other projects that we will then be looking at uh, going into the future, we will we'll probably be making sure that uh, those are looked into and we make sure that we provide those. Certainly uh, in terms of um, uh, infrastructure that, has been pro that was provided back then, they were cycle tracks. But I think uh, along the way, those cycle tracks were turned into something else uh, by elements which we, which we do not know exactly who. But I think um, we certainly need to reintroduce those cycle tracks and make sure that um, they are part of uh, the road network so that we properly um, aggregate traffic, vehicular and uh, human traffic where it really belongs and then these conflicts will be minimized and therefore we will be alleviating this congestion problem. Okay, so I want to come back to, to the solutions. Uh, you did say that some of them are very long term and we'll get to that. But I suppose we, before we get to the long term ones, in the immediate term, sure. is there anything that can be done? That perhaps it may not be infrastructure, but I don't know. What, what's your take? Certainly in the immediate term, there is something that can be done. I think there are a lot of uh, interventions that we can make in the mm -hmm. immediate term. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at some of the problems that we have in Arare Pesan, uh, some of the challenges that we have just have to do with uh, driver behavior. Probably also that will come into the long-term mm. uh, solution because mm. you cannot change somebody's behavior overnight. But there are certainly things that we can do from uh, a, a human perspective, from a driver perspective, from a pedestrian perspective, that are also in the immediate term. The immediate term solutions also that are coming in are those that you were, you were speaking to, mm. uh, clearing the veggies of the road so that at least um, um, vehicular traffic and uh, human traffic uh, are separated one from another so that at least we have a proper passage of traffic, uh, vehicular traffic and proper passage of, of, of human traffic. But looking at infrastructure, I, I wouldn't want to lie, uh, Farai. Mm -hmm. Infrastructure, the solutions that we, we are proposing for infrastructure, most of them are quite long term because of the initial capital outlay, like I've mentioned, that you would need for, 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 for us to then um, erect some of the infrastructure that we would need uh, to alleviate this congestion problem. But they are within that I I infrastructure uh, purview, there are some uh, solutions that we, we can look into in the immediate term. If you look at um, uh, separation of vehicular and, uh, and uh, human traffic, you look at your designation of mass transit lanes, if you are going to be using a bus, if you are going to be using a vehicle with a higher uh, occupancy, you can be separated into a, into, into a dedicated lane for that. Mm -hmm. that, that is promoting um, uh, good use of uh, the available uh, transport services that we have. So you look into issues also to do with um, 
uh, one-way streets. Mm -hmm. You look also into issues to do with your traffic lights, the, the, the repair of traffic lights. You look into issues to do with uh, um, interconnection of, of, uh, or, or the synchronization of our traffic lights so that there can be proper passage of vehicles from, from one end of town uh, to another. Those are some of the things that we can, we can uh, look into in the immediate uh, uh, term. Are those underway? Yes, sure. So how, e how easily can they be activated and done? No, sure. Uh, th that is really underway. Uh, we, we have been uh, speaking to city of Harare and we have been trying to find ways and means of um, achieving that. Um, you have also mentioned one that you, you know already mm -hmm. that um, we are coming up with those interventions. So it will certainly take um, a bit of time. It will, you, you know how it is with, uh, with change. Um, but we will certainly get there. So the designation of uh, high occupancy lanes, I think that can be done on ex existing infrastructure. If you look at um, the issue, one, one other aspect that I, that I also forgot to mention was the issue of uh, reversible lanes. You see traffic is moving in one direction in the morning and the other direction in the evening. Mm -hmm. So some of the lanes that we are leaving uh, for traffic that is going out of town in the morning, uh, can certainly be used by traffic that is coming in and we use mm. that as reversible lens and interchange uh, in the evening. So those, those are is, is just uh, road markings and then maybe publishing to say that this is now a reversible lane, this is now a one-way uh, street. So certainly that can be done, uh, quite easily done in the immediate term. Mm -hmm. Very interesting point you mentioned there, reversible lanes amongst others. Uh, the long term. Uh, which is what I think obviously uh, it is long term, it will take some time and we'll get there, but uh, what are some of those? Uh, in the long term, we are looking at uh, the issues to do with your interchanges, we are looking to introduce fire ducts, we are, intro we, we are looking to expand um, uh, the lanes that we have if space is available. So that is what we are looking at in the, in the longer term. We are looking also to change the configuration of some of our traffic circles by introducing slip lanes where it is possible, you see, but what remains a, a, a constriction is the issue of space. Indeed. We're going to leave it there for now because we need to take a break. When we come back, we'll continue the discussion. Engineer Pazipamide is my guest. We're talking about, uh, you know, some of the ways in which we can resolve this uh, challenge that we have with congestion in uh, Harare, certainly. But I'm sure these things will also be an issue for some of the other cities as we go forward and as they grow. Stay tuned. It is the Rebound Series. Every Zimbabwean wants their country to return to its former glory and we believe that we have a role to play in doing that. So we'll be speaking to different Zimbabweans from different facets of life to share their views of what it will take to get Zimbabwe to rebound. The Rebound series comes to you every Friday between 5 and 6 p.m. on the Heart and Soul digital platforms. Join me, Farai Mwakutuya, for those incisive discussions. Welcome back. The Rebound series continues. Engineer Maron Pasipamire is my guest from the Ministry of Transport and Infrastructure Development. Engineer, you said, you know, you talked about some of these very high level, um, you know, very long term projects. Um, sure. Could you give us an indication, if at all, a ballpark that we'll be looking at in terms of how much would this cost? In terms of the cost, Farai, I wouldn't want to lie to you to, and, and give um, a figure at the moment because this is really at the planning stage um, and we are um, looking for, forward to that planning stage informing uh, the numbers. So if I were to give you something today that would change mm -hmm. uh, tomorrow and then probably you then point fingers to say, but then he said <laughs> this much and yeah. then it's that yeah. much tomorrow then it's, it's a whole lot of um, uh, fracas in, in the end. But I think at the present moment, it is safe to say that um, uh, there are solutions that we are looking into. We are trying to see which are manageable now, which are man manageable in the medium term, which are manageable in the long term. Then we are going to put figures to those as and when we, 
we adopt which ones we are going to be to be looking at uh, in uh, at which stage you know in the spirit of, of international best practice i would imagine that there are other cities uh, sure. that may have been in a similar situation that we are in perhaps not exactly the same but facing the same sort of challenges where rapid expansion no space uh, have there been any similar cases that you perhaps have looked at or, or tried to study and borrow from earlier in the program i was speaking to uh, harare commuter omnibus operators who said they they went to lie sure. to copy the, to, to see how that model is run, done in terms of association and cooperatives mm -hmm. is there a model that you pe perhaps have looked at as harare uh, Zimbabwe, but Harare specifically, where you can say, look, this city was in a similar situation. This is how they managed to address it. I think, Farai, what we have been doing as a um, committee on, on, um, on the alleviation or elimination of, um, of congestion in um, urban local authorities, we have been looking at some of uh, the cities that have faced similar challenges. Some of them, as we look at them, we think that uh, they are still worse off. Uh, I think we, we are looking at uh, the situation in Harare as one that is still salvageable. So we are trying to, we are trying to, there are some, some examples that we are looking at and we are saying we don't want to get to this. Mm. If, you, if you look at, um, if you look at uh, Dar es Salaam, if you look at uh, Nairobi, mm. th there are challenges far worse off than what we have in Harare. And probably they have far much more traffic than we do here. But our situation, I think, is, is still salvageable. So what we really need to do is to look at those and say, how did they get to, that, to, to, um, to this stage? So we try and avoid whatever got them to that stage. Then we are also looking at um, some solutions that... Um, Closer home, mm -hmm. if you look at South Africa, there are other um, solutions probably that do not necessarily lie within the purview of uh, the Minister of Transport in, mm -hmm. in terms of infrastructure uh, provision. If you, if you look at uh, probably the governance issues, you look at your Johannesburg, it's, it is the economic capital. You look at your Pretoria, it is the political capital. So you, you have traffic really interchanging in the morning. It's in one direction uh, and in the other direction. Also, in terms of um, other aspects um, of the economy, other aspects of, uh, of the politics. Uh, that is what we are also trying to bring to the table to say, as we look at uh, these examples, which examples do we say they have improved on that? Which examples do we say they are worse off than us that we would want to avoid to get to? Indeed. I mean, uh, I lived in East Africa for a while, and many people, they will tell you that the traffic is so bad in Nairobi, you actually switch off the, <laughs> you switch off the engine. To, that's how long you have you to see. stop. So that's sure. how. But... Uh, Look, you don't want to get to that. Indeed. Yeah. Now, looking at the, the, the other options, I mean, you, you've just mentioned, which I think is a great example, which is the Pretoria-Johannesburg scenario, sure. uh, which is another suggestion, as you say, but perhaps out of the ministry's direct purview. But I think speaking from, you know, that point of, of analysis and observation, where we decentralize economic activity from Harare, yes, decentralize yeah. some of these offices into other cities as a longer term solution to the challenges so not everyone wants to be in harare sure mm -hmm. yeah not not everyone not, not everyone um, would be in harare if per se if we said um, we have uh, minister of transport offices are uh, based in gweru everyone who wants a operator's license is to go to gweru mm -hmm. that would take away a lot of traffic from Harare to Gweru. Mm -hmm. There is this um, new parliament building that is coming up in Mount Hamden. I, I am looking forward to uh, propositions also um, from the private sector to say, how do we then come in and uh, also get our piece of, of, of the cake that is available to say, what is the development that we are proposing also in terms of the vicinity of, of, of um, Mount Hamden to, so that we can take away traffic that would otherwise have passed through town. For example, uh, Charles Prince Airport uh, in Mount Hamden. If we were to develop Charles Prince Airport, uh, to make sure that it also receives international flights, it also receives um, uh, regional and domestic flights, how would that help to alleviate uh, the strain that we then put on, um, on, tra on, on traffic or on, on the roads from all the way from the airport to Mount Hamden? Mm -hmm. Certainly, if somebody were to land in, in a, a Charles Prince airport, 
they would just move quickly to, to, to the, parliament. Uh, the parliament and then they are off in the evening. No need to pass through town. There are many other things that we always come to town for that we do not necessarily need to come to town for. Mm. So we think um, we need to decentralize some of these things and make sure that the, some of these services are available out of town and also away from Harare. Indeed, uh, the point you just make there, I mean, I, I'm also just thinking, as you mentioned, Charles Prince, uh, but that parliament also there, hotel facilities, because yes, sure. a lot of these MPs that come from out of town sure. have to be put up in hotels. So it doesn't make sense for them to sit in parliament then have to drive all the way to CBD to put up in a hotel when they could stay over yeah, there. Thank you so much for that the point. point that you've just raised of private sector participation is sure. quite interesting. Sure. What room is there? And, and as, as, a, as a ministry, are you also welcoming to say private sector players come in and assist us in this in this challenge we face his excellency the president has always uh, maintained the mantra that zimbabwe is open for business and zimbabwe is open for business indeed you see um, there are many opportunities that uh, the private sector may actually be seeing out there and government may not necessarily be um, ready to say we have this opportunity but it is incumbent upon upon the private sector to come in and say we see a b c d e uh, we think this is how we could also come in and uh, help government in terms of um, what government should be putting up. We should also, the, the private sector should, should also own the narrative in terms of uh, the development of the country. There are gaps that they, they also see that, they, that may not necessarily be viewed as by, by government as, as gaps that will be existing. Is the environment enabling enough for them to participate? Is, is, if they come into your office and say, I have this proposal, will they be, will they be expedited or will they face blue, red tape and all these other things? Uh, the, the environment is, is very conducive, Farai. I think um, um, it, it will only take uh, those that are then uh, brave enough to visit or those, are, those who, are, who trust in the government enough to visit. If they just visit, they will then see that uh, these opportunities are really available and we do lend a, a listening ear and we, we are prepared to, uh, to also um, uh, take them through uh, the processes that they need to, to take for them to, to then realize um, those opportunities that they will be seeing. Uh, talking about, uh, again, uh, regional and international sort of cases and, and, and examples we could follow, uh, looking at South Africa, for example, and I think in other jurisdictions as well, we've seen trains playing a role in terms of as a mass, you know, source or mass, uh, you know, transit option that could decongest. So if people are using a train, not everyone has to drive into town. Sure. In the past, we've also seen trains plying, I think, from Abvuku into CBD uh, and Kwadzana and places like that. Do you think that that can also be an option that we can pursue here? And Cert how feasible is that? Certainly, uh, Farai, I think um, the issue of mass trans transit transport systems is uh, as a bigger role to play. But if you look at uh, the infrastructure that is available, in terms of your um, uh, train systems. That will then be a deterrent factor in the short term. But in the long term, certainly because of, um, because of the initial capital outlay that you would need for, for you to, to uh, look at the Chitungwiza rail um, mm. network that we had wanted to, we have, we have always said we, we want to do this, we want to do this, but it's taking time. So I think in terms of uh, the initial capital outlay, that is uh, one aspect probably that will delay. But I think eventually we are going to get to that because the need for, for, for such systems is becoming more and more apparent. Uh, also, if you look at your uh, rapid uh, bus systems, those are also um, something that we are looking into and we, we have been... Uh, looking at this with, with that ad, ad hoc interministerial committee that, I, that I've mentioned about, we are looking at it with um, partners like Zubco to see how best we can, uh, they can also come um, into, into play and make sure that uh, we provide those. Engineer, before we, we run out of time, there are two quick things I'd like to take you up on. You've just mentioned the, the uh, Shitungwiza Rail project and, and, and all these other things that will require an initial capital outlay. You've talked about private sector coming on board. Private sector is enticed and attracted by profit and the return that they'll get on their investment. In the past, we've sort of seen, and you know, these train projects I talked about were very subsidized and so it, it didn't make commercial or viable sense. If we were to 
put up some of this infrastructure, would a private investor be able to get their return? Because it costs money. People will have to be charged. There will need to be toll fees, for instance, uh, user fees. Do we, as Zimbabweans, do we have that discipline? And, and, and are we inclined that way that we must pay for services that we consume? You see, some of these things, you don't just go into them without um, being properly informed by uh, things like your feasibility studies. Uh, the challenge that we have is that uh, the feasibility studies that we currently uh, have, um, yes, they may be a good starting point, but they no longer hold that much water because they could have been overtaken by events. So one aspect that we would then need to do is to uh, look at those feasibility studies and uh, look to do other uh, feasibility studies on those uh, follow-up feasibility studies for us to actually go in there um, with a proper information. What is the situation? What is uh, the environment that is obtaining now? How conducive is it for uh, uh, that system to be introduced? Then we can make our decisions based on that. Otherwise, we may go in with something that is uh, now overtaken by events and we then go around in circles when um, uh, we are not able to recoup funds. Mm. Very lastly, uh, you know, I think everyone must commend and, and, and say the great job that the ministry has done in terms of, you know, some of the highways and some of the roads that we are seeing a lot of progress being done there. Uh, as a dweller of, 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 uh, of Harare City, sure. uh, I am also concerned. I'm sure many people are also wondering, uh, will our neighborhood streets and roads ever get that sort of attention? Uh, is, that, is this ever, you know, these portals, is this something that will ever be fixed? Certainly, Farai, we have tried to look into that from, from a central government point of view to say that um, uh, through the emergency roads rehabilitation program that we have already rolled out, which is going to run for three years from 2021 to 2023, we have tried to take away some of um, um, the roads that um, city councils were supposed to do in order for them to then look at those um, streets that you are talking about. So we are hoping that by so doing, um, this act from central government will make um, uh, the city fathers realize that at least we are creating room for them to use uh, some of the funds that they have to do other roads while central government is also looking in, uh, into the roads that they should have been doing. But he said, okay, let's chip in and do this. So we're trying to address that through the emergency roads rehabilitation program too. Uh, but how then each uh, city then uh, uh, takes that, it's, it's basically how they take it. Uh, and probably some of the things would then not be able um, uh, to, to dictate the pace. But certainly uh, government has tried to come into play on that one. Thank you so much for, for those insights and that information and for being a fantastic guest on the program. Thank you so much, Farai. Engineer Maron Pasbamire is a, from the Ministry of Transport and Infrastructure Development. He's been sharing with us uh, his insights and, 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 and uh, you know, way forward in terms of addressing the challenges that we're facing, but also giving us uh, some of the, uh, you know, insights and, and, and expert opinion in terms of, you know, the challenges that are there, the feasibility and the options going forward. Very informative. Thank you so much for coming through to the program. Sure. And thank you so much to our listeners and viewers for participating and for watching us and for choosing us. It is the Rebound series. My name is Farai Mwakutuya. Do join me again next time for another edition. Bye-bye.